Hello, my name is Osgur Sunovlu and I'm with New York University Abu Dhabi. Today I'd like to talk about trustworthy integrated circuit design and I'll do so over a, a few uh, presentation modules. In this first module I'd like to raise the big question, can we trust these integrated circuits, these electronic chips? Why are we questioning this trust? Where is this uh, paranoia coming from? And what are the main concerns that people have when it comes to trust in integrated circuits? And then in the subsequent modules, I'd like to get into what we can do about this. How can we regain trust in the integrated circuits or chips that we design and manufacture? But before we get into the issue of trust, let me first acknowledge the fact that these integrated circuits, these chips, are everywhere around us. They go into medical devices that control our lives that we heavily rely on. We find integrated circuits or, or chips in our smartphones, in our computers, in televisions, in appliances, in medical devices. In a car, we have hundreds of these chips. If these electronic chips are somehow compromised, this means that our lives would be severely affected, sometimes in catastrophic ways. So here's an outline of the rest of this presentation as well as the uh, upcoming modules. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, raise the big question, do we trust these integrated circuits, these electronic chips? Um, and then in the subsequent modules, I'll get into uh, a few techniques that help designers regain trust in their, in their chips. And these techniques are logic locking, speed manufacturing, and IC camouflaging. But first, let's get into the issue of trust. Where is this paranoia coming from? But before we get into the issue of trust, we first need to understand how these electronic chips are designed and manufactured. What are the steps a design company needs to go through in order to develop this, this chip that you see on the screen? So obviously a design company has a bunch of design teams, but today the problem is these chips are extremely complex and they, they embed a multitude of functionalities which require various expertise uh, within the same company. The design company may be able to support uh, most of these functionalities, but there may be some functionalities where the design company uh, is missing the design expertise. So for, the, for such blocks, the design company needs to go to other vendors that we refer to as IP vendors and obtain design blocks from these third-party vendors. And then once individual pieces have been designed, there is an integration team within the design company that needs to put together all these design blocks into the, into the final design that is represented at a kind of a high level uh, uh, abstraction, which is referred to as registered transfer level netlist. At this point in time, the design of the chip is finished, but the representation is, is kind of abstract in the sense that uh, the design is defined in terms of what happens in every clock cycle, how does the information propagate from one block to the next within uh, uh, within different clock cycles. This registered transfer uh, level netlist needs to go through a step called logic synthesis where the end product of the step is called the gate level netlist. Now gate level netlist is again another representation of the, of the design of the chip but this time it's a lower level abstraction where we're talking in terms of the interconnectivity of logic gates and sequential elements such as flip-flops. And this gate level netlist needs to go through another step called the physical synthesis step where now we're talking about transistors uh, placed on the final layout of the design. Now everything that we've talked about up until this point, we're talking about design represented in, in a soft form, soft electronic form. Everything is represented in terms of electronic files. There is nothing concrete yet. Once the design layout is ready, this layout is then sent out for fabrication to a foundry. That's when things become concrete. That's when chips start to be produced. And then these chips um, needs to go through, they need to go through an extensive testing process because things may go wrong during the manufacturing process and some of these chips may end up being defective. So to be able to screen out the, the bad chips, we need to test them. And uh, once the good chips are identified, they're packaged and assembled, and finally we obtain 
the integrated circuits that we, we showed at the beginning of the slide. So um, once the integrated circuits are, are developed, then these, these chips go into systems, we mount them on, on the boards, on PCBs, and at that point they're deployed uh, in the field, they go and support various applications such as phones, uh, computers, whatever devices that these chips are supposed to go into. Now that we talked about and described how an integrated circuit is designed and manufactured, let's now uh, put this all into perspective briefly uh, and let's do so visually. In the process, let's refer to a particular design, a chip design company. Now, in the 80s, before globalization, the steps that we talked about were done all in-house. This particular design company uh, used to have its design teams in California, Bay Area. They used to do the fabrication uh, of the chips in their own controlled facilities, again, in California, San Francisco. Testing, packaging, assembly, everything was done uh, in their own, uh, within their own company. In, all in California where the headquarters were and then once the chips were ready they were deployed all around the world uh, to customers everywhere now the problem is uh, compared to 20 30 years ago things changed drastically and uh, there have been two main changes the first change has been that the chips are now much more complex compared to 20 30 years ago they have uh, more functionalities, and that's why the chips uh, need to be designed by leveraging the expertise of possibly third-party IP vendors as well. That's the first change. The second change is the cost of owning a fab that, that manufactures these chips is in the order of billions of dollars. So more and more design companies are going fabless. And this particular company also went fabless. They're outsourcing the fabrication of their chips. So this company today now has its own design teams, but in addition, they obtain design blocks from, from design teams in uh, Europe, in China and India. They do the fabrication now in South Korea. Uh, they outsource fabrication to a third party foundry in South Korea. Testing, packaging uh, takes place in Taiwan. Uh, assembly happens in China and the, um, the headquarters of this company is still in the Bay Area in San Francisco, California. Once the chips are ready, uh, they're deployed everywhere um, uh, in the world, just like uh, in the past. So who's this company? Uh, it's, it's Apple. So as we've seen, um, over the past few decades, the design paradigm has changed from centralized to distributed. And it is this distributed design flow that, that creates concern for people. It's the fact that not every single step of the design and manufacturing flow is under the control of the design company leads to various concerns ranging from counterfeiting to piracy, reverse engineering to Trojans. And uh, next, uh, I'd like to talk about these trust issues, these concerns, one at a time, starting with Trojans. So Trojans, we, we all know the, the software counterpart of Trojans, but hardware Trojans refer to malicious modifications embedded in the designs at the hardware level. The objective of a Trojan designer could be to control, to modify, disable, or monitor an electronic chip. So they may want to uh, disable a chip remotely while the chip is operational in the field. They may want to leak sensitive information as the chip is communicating in the field as well. So these could be uh, various uh, motivations for implanting Trojan at the hardware level into a chip. Now, how can this happen? Well, we talked about uh, design companies obtaining design blocks from third-party IP vendors. Now these blocks are of course verified for functionality. They're checked against what they're supposed to be doing and they go through extensive simulations. But the problem is it's very difficult to make sure that a design block does everything they're supposed to do and nothing more. And 
there is no guarantees that the design block can be trojan free can be free of backdoors uh, inserted in them so they may be untrusted and they are a source of hardware trojans the other scenario is an untrusted fab the design company sends out the uh, layout to a fabrication facility to produce chips but the foundry can make small changes to the mask as they manufacture these chips and malicious circuitry can be inserted into the chips that are produced at the foundry. Now has this ever happened? Have we ever encountered hardware trojans? While there is no real proof of hardware trojans, there have been a lot of anecdotal evidences. And one particular case, for instance, about a decade ago, um, there was an incident where a country sent a couple of missiles to another country and during the attack, for whatever reason, the radar system was shut down so that the two missiles uh, hit and struck the, the, the country that, that had the radar system uh, that was blocked out. Now this uh, back then was attributed to hardware trojans because the country that had this radar system did not really uh, produce the radar system themselves. They were obtaining it from, from other uh, countries. Um, and there are many other anecdotal evidences such as this one. The other trust issue is counterfeiting. Um, we all know counterfeiting in the context of uh, medical pills or watches or, or bags, but we, we also have counterfeit electronics today. And in this context, in the context of counterfeit chips, we're talking about chips that were rejected during testing or that were used in the field and then they were thrown away. It's a big industry in a certain part of the world where they collect these scrap boards, they um, take out the chips from the boards, they process them, they polish them, they make like they make them look like brand new, and then somehow these used chips, possibly not functioning properly, they find their way back into the supply chain and they're sold as brand new. And we refer to them as counterfeit chips. Now, obviously there could be catastrophic um, end results, uh, because of reliability issues, but the most imminent concern is the financial loss that's associated with counterfeit chips. And this, these could happen in a malicious test facility, malicious uh, assembly unit, or uh, malicious third-party sellers. Um, this, is all as a, this is all an end result of the distributed uh, IC supply chain. Now, there was, a, um, there was an incident about a decade ago uh, back in the U.S., um, counterfeit network components, Cisco network components were detected in certain applications and the problem was that these were going to be military applications so FBI had to get involved. Um, now the, back then the problem uh, was really not the profit that the counterfeiters were targeting but rather FBI's concern was whether these counterfeit chips had backdoors in them simply because these chips were going to support military applications. The other trust issue is reverse engineering. Reverse engineering by definition means uh, you take an end product and you try to understand the, the details, the design details that led to uh, that, that end product. And in the context of uh, integrated circuits or chips, reverse engineering is done mainly to uh, be able to, first of all, understand design details and to possibly pirate the design or to understand the details in order to be able to uh, insert meaningful Trojans that would do harmful things. And uh, to be able to insert a Trojan, um, you need to be able to hide it in the design. That's why you need to understand the functionality. So you first need to reverse engineer uh, the design. Um, in an untrusted fab, for instance, reverse engineering is can be done easily because the fab has all the information to, uh, to produce uh, the chips. They have the layout, so that layout can be analyzed to be able to understand uh, the design details. But people have shown that even the final product, the actual chip, can be reverse engineered and the original design can be reconstructed. Uh, people have shown that they could take a chip, they could depackage it, and then uh, they take the images from individual metal layers. Now the chip consists of multiple metal layers, so they need to use chemicals to delayer the chip. Uh, they take layers, they peel the layers one at a time, and they take their images. 
and once they do some image processing they stitch the images to reconstruct the design the netlist uh, that led to the end product which is the chip uh, in fact there is a company in the US in the Bay Area goes by the name of Chipworks that provides reverse engineering as a service so you may take the chips of your competitor uh, to this company Chipworks you may ask them to reverse engineer your competitors chip and then you would look at the chip of your competitor to see whether they uh, used your IP they pirated your IP your design IP on their chips so just to illustrate the fact that re whether re reverse engineering can be done whether it's feasible I just gave this example Chipworks um, a company that provides this as a service the other uh, trust issue is ICIP piracy and overbuilding. Now, I already talked about uh, design companies going to third party IP vendors to obtain design blocks from them. Uh, one example is a UK based microprocessor design company called ARM. ARM uh, provides microprocessor uh, design blocks to other design companies to be used in their system on chips or uh, controllers. So, when ARM provides uh, its microprocessor block to a design company, they uh, make a contract, they agree on the usage, but there is really nothing technically sp sp uh, stopping the design company from overusing the design blocks that ARM provides to them. They could actually use it in multiple versions of their chips without notifying ARM and without, without uh, paying them the proper fees. So this is one form of uh, IP piracy or IP overbuilding. Um, the other form of um, IP piracy or rather IC piracy is when a design company sends their uh, layout to a fab for fabrication they agree on a certain number they may say please fabricate 1000 parts from this design to the fab but there is again nothing that's stopping the fab from overproducing the chips so from the same design they may actually produce 2000 parts rather than 1000 parts and they may make extra profit in the aftermarket or in the in the uh, black market so these are different forms of uh, piracy or overbuilding and uh, there are there have been many uh, lawsuits uh, involving uh, sometimes arm the example that i gave um, about the ip piracy issues So to summarize, uh, the design manufacturing flow today is quite different compared to the one that we had 20-30 years back. Um, there are two reasons for this. One, designs are uh, much more complex. And two, uh, the cost of owning a fab is in the order of billions. So more and more design companies today are um, using third-party IP blocks in their designs and also the outsourcing fabrication to third-party uh, fabrication uh, companies. So this distributed IC supply chain has given rise to a variety of concerns from counterfeiting, reverse engineering to hardware trojans. If you talk to different companies or different agencies, people will tell you different concerns, which really depends on the business model that they're in, um, what concerns that they have. Thank you very much. For uh, listening, this concludes the first module uh, of our presentation.